Hello! It's so good to be back. How's everybody doing? I missed you while I was in the Holy Land coaching uh, two teams in the Maccabea Games, the Masters and Grandmasters golf teams from the USA. And I'm so proud of my squads. They both won the team gold medals. Let's light up the darkness. All right. Who is with us as we gather once again to do some beautiful learning? And we're going to be moving fast today, but let us welcome Pauline in Chicagoland. Sharon says, welcome back. Paula in Chicago, Bill in Missouri. Sharon asking for Misha Bayrock prayers for her dear friend, Rabbi Dan Grossman, Yitzhak Haim ben Moshe Veshendel. May he have a refua shlema. Stephen in Dover, New Hampshire. Gwen in Michigan. Bella in Florida. Renee in Indiana. Larry in Queens. Renee says, welcome home. Lisa says, welcome home. Paula says, welcome back. You're all so kind. Shandora in the Bronx. Guy in Ohio. Soren in Saigon. Wow. Tuning in from across the Pacific. Great to have you with us, Soren. Tom says, welcome back, Michelle in Indiana, uh, Pauline, Paula, 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 Sandy, Bill, you guys are awesome, James, good to see you there, over there on the YouTube side, Aoife checking in, as well as Marie Maud Latour, welcome back, everybody, it's great to have you with us here. We lit the candle. That was, okay, we're going to be working our way through another Baruch Chait album. This one is called Salonika, The Voice of Salonika, Volume 3. And that song was called Shisulim. All right, so <clears throat> I was away for 17 days. <laughs> so we're going to be covering highlights. Uh, hopefully we'll get through it today. Highlights from 17 pages worth of Talmud. Uh, obviously, we're not even going to cover, I think we'll probably touch on something at least in every page. Uh, but I'm really, you know, hopefully you were reading on your own. And I'm just going to share some highlights from these pages that we missed so that we can get ourselves back on schedule. So we're in Tractate Kesuvos, the 15th volume of the Talmud. Uh, these are the laws of the marriage contract. And here in chapter one, the first Mishnah uh, was about the fact that a virgin bride gets married on a Wednesday and a widow on a Thursday. And the reason is that the virgin bride in ancient times, it was, you know, it was obviously very important uh, that she be a virgin if she was presented as a virgin. And if the groom discovers that she's not a virgin, he's going to go to court court uh, to have this, you know, the, 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 to have this wedding annulled or at least that the marriage contract would be adjusted because, these, you know, under Jewish law, it was a revolutionary thing in ancient times uh, in such a patriarchal society where only the men had a unilateral right to procure a divorce from the wife. The wife couldn't demand a divorce, but the husband could at will give a divorce. So the sages protected the women that a man couldn't just arbitrarily say, you know what, I'm sick of you, leave. Uh, and she's divorced and goes out with nothing, but rather uh, she receives a marriage contract when she enters the, the marriage. And if the man should divorce her, he's going to have to pay a hefty sum of money. Uh, and if she's a virgin, it's going to be a larger sum than if she's not a virgin uh, as she enters the marriage. So she will leave with this, you know, this payment that the guy must give. But if he was told that she's a virgin and she's not a virgin, so he wants that marriage contract adjusted and he's going to run to court the next day. Uh, and that's how this Mishnah started here in chapter one. Now, what's interesting about this volume and this comes up again and again in these uh, 17 pages that we're going to be covering quickly, is that on the one hand, we have this very emotional content 
the laws of marriage. Is she a virgin? Is she a widow? Uh, you know, s- seemingly it's all about sexuality and intimate matters. But actually, w- more often what the sages are debating in these pages are laws of evidence. And it actually becomes about who can testify, which witnesses are deemed credible, what kind of testimony is credible, what can be established in a court via the testimony of witnesses and what cannot. Uh, And so we have to be careful to separate the kind of emotionality of the intimate issues from what's really, you know, what the sages are much more comfortable discussing is laws of evidence and laws of testimony. All right. So, and it's not that they're uncomfortable discussing any kind of very personal issues. I mean, we've seen over and over again, they'll go there, whatever the, whatever the issue is, they'll go there. Uh, but you know, there's only sort of so much to be said about certain private, you know, bodily functions. Uh, and it's a different question about how we establish, you know, what is found kind of in an intimate sphere. How do we establish that in a court of law? And once we establish these evidentiary rules about these matters, those evidentiary rules extend well beyond questions of marriage, divorce, uh, you know, virginity, non-virginity, etc. These laws of evidence extend to all kinds of cases, you know, whether it's farmers suing each other, land disputes, you know, people borrowing tools and implements from each other, all kinds of stuff like that is going to be subject to very similar evidentiary principles. Okay, so uh, we are going to be covering pages three. Every tractate in the Talmud starts on page two. We had covered the first page of this tractate before I left page two. So we start on page three, uh, but we start skipping right away, right? So we're, we start officially on page three, but we go to 3B for the first stuff that we're going to cover t- together today. So the Barisa states, and from, the t- from a time of danger and onward, the people adopted the custom to marry on Tuesday as well, and the sages did not reprimand them, right? So originally they picked the day of the week to marry on so that if a husband discovered that his virgin bride was not a virgin bride, he could rush to court the next day. Why was that on Thursday? Because as we've seen before, in small towns that didn't have a permanent courthouse with judges meeting every day, a court would be in session on Mondays and Thursdays. And they weren't going to get married on Shabbat for various reasons. So it became that they would get married on a Wednesday so he could go to court on Thursday. But right away, that, print, that, that, that uh, tradition started to change. Right? From a time of danger, danger means persecution of the Jews, like, for example, the Roman persecution. So from a time of danger and onward, the people adopted the custom to marry on Tuesday as well, and the sages did not reprimand them. And on Monday, one may not marry, even in a time of danger. However, if it is due to the coercion, it is permitted, right? If they must make the wedding on that day, okay, then it's permitted. And the Barisa concludes, one isolates the groom from the virgin bride so that he will not engage in intercourse with her for the first time on Shabbat evening, Friday night, because by rupturing the hymen, right? So if she's a virgin, there would be that, uh, you know, that, that, that fold of skin that would get ruptured. Uh, and so when he ruptures the hymen, when they make love for the first time, if she's a virgin, she might bleed. And so that is an inflicting a wound. And we don't wound, we don't draw blood on Shabbos, just as we don't shecht, right? We don't slaughter animals. Uh, Wounding a a person on purpose is considered a kind of work, and that's prohibited on Shabbos. So the Gemara elaborates, what is the danger mentioned in the Baraisa? If we say it is referring to a situation where the government said that a virgin who is married on Wednesday will be executed, Would the response be merely that they adopted the custom to marry on Tuesday? Let them totally abolish the ordinance to marry on Wednesday in order in the face of life-threatening danger. And Rav has said the Bryce is referring to a period where the government said that a virgin who is married on Wednesday will submit to intercourse with the prefect first. So we see that this, this is a terrible, I mean, horrific practice Uh, that existed in many times and places in the ancient world. Uh, You know, we've seen it in medieval times. It's called the first night, right? The the rite of the first night. 
Uh, can you imagine where, you know, in feudal societies, like where the, the local lord, as it were, or here a kind of regional Roman governor or Greek governor, whoever it is, uh, who is ruling over the local Jewish subjects when, you know, and not just the Jews, but when people get married in his district uh, before she sleeps with her husband for the first time, she's forced to basically be raped uh, by the local governor. You know, thank God we don't live in such a time when practices like that exist, but they did exist in the ancient world. And what would they do? Uh, right. So, uh, so when that kind of thing was happening, so the Gemara questions the formulation of the Baraisa. Is that characterized as danger? It's not exactly danger. It is coercion. The Gemara answers, well, there is also danger involved as there are virtuous women who would give their lives rather than allow themselves to be violated. And they will come into mortal danger because they would not submit you know, to the rape of this local uh, politician. And they would either kill themselves or allow themselves to be killed rather than submit to that rape. Uh, all right, we go forward a little bit. And uh, rather than read a whole discussion, I'll just read what the, the halacha is, how it came out. If the groom's father dies after the wedding preparations were completed and it is a place where the prepared items cannot be sold and will be lost if the wedding is postponed, or similarly, if the bride's mother dies and it will be impossible to reproduce the preparation invested in the hair, clothing, and jewelry of the bride, the corpse is placed in a separate room and the wedding proceeds as planned. Right. So here, apropos this idea, what day of the week are we going to get? Is a wedding going to happen? You know, if a very close relative died, so now you have a kind of um, conflict between the joy of the wedding and the sadness of the funeral, and you would postpone the wedding. But if you know, these are people who are not very rich and they poured so much money into the wedding preparation and then there was this death, so what do they do? So they put the corpse aside, have the wedding, and then bury the corpse the next day. Uh, and the wedding takes place and is followed by seven days of feasting and seven days of mourning. Specifically, if it is the father of the groom or the mother of the bride who died, as in that case, there is no other person who would exert themselves for them. They are the ones responsible for the wedding preparations, and therefore the preparations that were completed must be utilized. However, if the opposite takes place, i.e. the mother of the groom or the father of the bride dies, no, the practice is different. The corpse is buried immediately, the seven-day mourning period is observed, and only afterward the couple goes forward with the wedding feast. That was on page 4a. Now we skip forward. Uh, to page 4b. The master said in the Barisa, in any event, the groom may not engage in intercourse with his virgin bride, neither on Shabbat evening nor at the conclusion of Shabbat. Now granted, on Shabbat evening, he may not engage in intercourse due to the prohibition against inflicting a wound on Shabbat. However, at the conclusion of Shabbat, after Shabbos ends, Saturday night, why may he not engage in intercourse with his virgin bride? And Rabbi Zairus said, now we're on 5a, it is due to calculations performed on Shabbat to prepare for the wedding. He would thereby engage <coughs> in weekday matters on Shabbat. Right? If you were having a wedding on Saturday night, you know you, you wouldn't be able to help yourself. Uh, prima nocta, somebody's telling me, is that term for that, uh, that terrible practice. Um, but in terms of getting married on Saturday night, you would naturally do some kind of preparation for the Saturday night wedding during Shabbos. And that is an important principle that is still valid today and valid at all times, that on Shabbos, we don't do anything for after Shabbos. For example, if you were going to take a red-eye flight on Saturday night, we sometimes do that, you can't be packing for your flight during Shabbat, even though all you'd be doing maybe is moving folded clothes from one place to another, which itself is not a prohibited labor, the fact that you're making a preparation on Shabbos for something that happens after Shabbos is prohibited. So you wouldn't plan a wedding on Saturday night. Now, Valle said to him, and our calculations for a mitzvah 
prohibited on Shabbos? But wasn't it Rav Chista and Rav Hamnuna who both said, with regard to calculations for a mitzvah, it is permitted to reckon them on Shabbos. And Rabbi Lazar said, one may allocate charity to the poor on Shabbat. You can say, well, you know, I have some money sitting around and in my mind I'm designating that, you know, a certain amount of it I'm going to give to charity. So I'm preparing to do something that will happen after Shabbos. I'm thinking about it, making a plan during Shabbos, but it's for the purpose of a mitzvah, giving charity. Well, a wedding is a mitzvah. It's a great mitzvah, one of the greatest mitzvahs. So why can't we make some kind of you know thought process, right? Designating calculations, what they're saying. They don't mean like adding sums on a piece of paper, but in your mind, designating things that are going to happen after Shabbos. If it's relating to a wedding, why not? And Rabbi Yaakov said that Rabbi Yochanan said one goes to synagogues and study halls to supervise matters affecting the multitudes on Shabbos. And Rabbi Yaakov bar said, Rabbi Yochanan said one supervises matters of saving a life on Shabbat. And Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmani said that Rabbi Yochanan said one goes to theaters and circuses to supervise matters affecting the multitudes on Shabbat because the fate of the Jewish people or of individual Jews is often decided there and one's presence could prevent calamity. Now obviously we know that Pekuach Nefesh, when it comes to saving a life, yes, that trumps Shabbos. We will violate Shabbos in order to save a life. But, you know, making plans for a wedding, that's not saving a life. And the sage of the school of Menashe taught, one makes matches among families concerned for a young girl to be betrothed on Shabbat. You might say, well, you know, hey, hey, Jim, you've got a son, I've got a daughter. Let's get them together so that they could get married. And we could even have that conversation on Shabbos. And similarly, one, make, one may make arrangements for a young boy to teach him Torah and to teach him a craft. Apparently, calculations for a mitzvah may be reckoned on Shabbat, including calculations for a wedding. Therefore, this cannot be the reason for the prohibition against marrying at the conclusion of Shabbat. So it's not that it's we're making calculations is the reason we don't get married Saturday night, but we don't get married on Saturday night. We just didn't determine what the reason for that was yet. We skip forward uh, and, and the ensuing discussion and discussing the possibility that the day for weddings in a city where the court meets every day. So it's like, what difference does it make? What, did, what night you get married? Uh, you know, it's not that court only meets on Thursday. It could meet on any day. So can we get married on any day? Uh, but nevertheless, the wedding should be on Wednesday. Uh, but if so, maybe you can postpone having intercourse for the first time since there's no rush to get to the court the next day. Maybe the first time they have intercourse should be on a different night. We discussed that on pages 5A and 5B. Uh, but we are skipping forward. And the next time we are going to check in for a highlight. Uh, is on page 7a. Rav Nachman bar Yitzhak taught uh, that uh, a, a ruling of Rabbi Yochanan. So Rav Abahu said, Rabbi Yishmael ben Yaakov, who is from Tyr or Tyre, asked Rabbi Yochanan in Sidon, and I heard the exchange, what is the law with regard to ex engaging in intercourse with one's virgin wife for the first time on Shabbos? And he said to him, it is prohibited. And the Gemara concludes, and the law is, that it is permitted to engage in intercourse with one's virgin wife for the first time on Shabbat, and one need not be concerned lest he cause a wound, create an opening, or initiate bleeding. And what is the law? It is permitted to engage in intercourse with one's virgin wife for the first time on Shabbat. And there is no concern that causing a wound or pain will entail a desecration of Shabbat. So they had the concern, but they worked their way through it. We skip forward uh, and we come on page 8a uh, to a discussion of now that we're talking about weddings. What are the Sheva Brachas? What are the seven blessings that are recited at the wedding, right? Under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy. And actually the, the Sheva Brachas, these seven blessings are recited uh, at the parties which follow, right? Traditional Jews will have a wedding and then the, the, the bride and groom don't go away yet for their honeymoon. Rather, they have seven nights of parties. 
uh, where each little party, usually like a dinner, like a dinner party, is thrown for them by one of their friends, inviting a bunch of friends over, just a nice dinner. And at that nice dinner, the seven blessings are read. Uh, so you get the wedding and seven days of partying. And every day, the seven blessings are read. And the sage is taught, one recites the benediction of the grooms in a quorum of 10 men all seven days of the wedding celebrations. And Rav Yehuda said, and what is, and that is the case only when new faces who did not previously participate in the festivities came to join the celebration. And Nina and I actually recently uh, were, were sort of honored or, you know, enjoyed the fact that some people that we kind of know, but we're not close friends with them, so we weren't invited to the wedding. Uh, but uh, we're, we are close with the aunt and uncle of the, the kid who was married. Uh, and the aunt and uncle were throwing one of these Sheva Brachas parties. And part of the tradition is that when you have, you know, these, these parties uh, each on the nights following the wedding, in order to be permitted to recite the seven blessings that are recited under the wedding canopy at these follow-up parties, there has to be an element of novelty, meaning that uh, there has to be among the guests at the Sheva Brachas dinner, somebody who was not at the wedding. You need some new faces at these dinners. Like you actually go looking for people who are not at the wedding and who can attend the dinner party on these nights which follow, and that actually permits the reading of the blessings that are normally recited only under the wedding canopy now can be recited again uh, at these dinner parties, right? So we were the new faces that night. And I only, it's pertinent to mention it now uh, because at that Sheva Brachas that we were invited to, to be the new faces, we met these wonderful people, uh, Abba and Pamela Clayman, uh, who live in the old city in Jerusalem. And when I was just there, you know, a few days ago, spending Shabbos in Jerusalem, they invited me to stay by them. And, you know, they host beautiful Shabbat dinners. Uh, and it was such an amazing experience. And we met them because Nina and I were the new faces at a Sheva Brachas dinner. And the Gemara asks, what blessings does one recite? What are the seven blessings? And Rav Yehuda said that these are the seven blessings. Number one, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created all for his glory. The second blessing is, blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator of the universe, uh, uh, creator of mankind. The third blessing, blessed are you, Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who made humanity in his image, in the image of the likeness of his form, and out of his very self formed a building. See Genesis 2.22, for eternity. Blessed are you, Lord, creator of mankind. The fourth blessing, may the barren referring to the city of Jerusalem, may the barren greatly rejoice and delight with the ingathering of her children within her in joy. Blessed are you, Lord, who gladdens Zion through her children. The fifth blessing, bring great joy to these loving friends as you gave joy to your creations in Eden, like the Garden of Eden, in ancient times. Blessed are you, Lord, who brings joy to the groom and bride. The sixth blessing, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created joy and gladness, groom and bride, delight, exultation, happiness, jubilation, love, brotherhood, and peace and friendship. Soon, Lord our God, may there be heard in the cities of Judea and in the streets of Jerusalem the sound of joy and the sound of gladness, the sound of the groom and the sound of the bride, the joyous sound of grooms from their wedding canopy and of young people from their feast of song. Blessed are you, Lord, who makes the groom rejoice with the bride. Aren't these beautiful blessings? Traditionally, at a wedding and at the Sheva Brachas dinners, each blessing is read by a different person. Somebody who's honored, if you have prominent rabbis present, you know, they'll read one blessing each or guests that you want to honor. And the Gemara relates, uh, Levi happened to come to the house of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi during the wedding celebration of Rabbi Shimon, his son, and recited five of these blessings. Rav Asi happened to come to Rav Ashi during the wedding celebration of Mar, his son, and recited six of these blessings. And then the discussion goes on. Uh, page eight, we get to page nine. 
Uh, Rabbi Elazar said, a groom who says, now getting back to this idea that a groom might discover that his virgin bride is not a virgin. So a groom who says, I encountered an unobstructed orifice, claiming that when he consummated the marriage, he discovered that his bride was not a virgin. The hymen was not intact. He is credible to render her forbidden to himself. Right, so recall that uh, there were there were always, traditionally in ancient times there were two steps to the wedding process. Nowadays, the betrothal and the marriage itself happen on the same day, but back then the betrothal often preceded the wedding itself by a year. And yet, during that betrothal period, it wasn't like being engaged. Betrothal meant they were married, even though they hadn't slept together yet. Right. Once they're betrothed, she becomes prohibited to anyone else. If she has sex with some other person during the betrothal period, she has committed adultery. Uh, and she then becomes prohibited to her husband forever. So if he says that he found her not a virgin and that this happened, that during the time that they were betrothed, not somehow her hymen was broken or she was raped or she had sex uh, at, you know, after she was betrothed, um, that it's going to have different consequences, right? So a groom who says, I encountered an unobstructed orifice, claiming that when he consummated the marriage, he discovered that his bride was not a virgin. He is credible to render her forbidden to himself. Although it is not always possible to corroborate his claim with testimony that his wife committed adultery after betrothal, he is credible to render her forbidden to him as though she had in fact committed adultery. So it's interesting, based on his own testimony, she doesn't become an established adulteress uh, who might even be subject to the death penalty, but by making this claim, he renders her prohibited to him. Uh, and that is the law. So let's just read what the law is. If a priest, be, uh, regarding a priest, right? So a priest is a different situation than a regular Jew. Why? Because if a woman is, let's say a, a married woman uh, is raped, right? Against her will, she's raped by some ho her horrific man. Uh, so then, you know, she and her husband are still permitted to each other. It's tragic that she was raped, but it doesn't affect her marriage. Unfortunately, if a woman is married to a priest, and she's raped by some other man, she then does become prohibited to her husband uh, if he is going to continue serving as a priest in the holy temple. It was just this like much higher standard of holiness. Uh, and even though it's not her fault and she is permitted to go marry some other Jew, she can't be married to a priest. So if a priest betrothes a woman, marries her after a period of time, and claims that he discovered that his wife was not a virgin when consummating the marriage, then the woman is forbidden to him, as there is only one uncertainty, whether she lost her virginity before or after she was betrothed to her husband. However, if the man is not a priest, the woman is permitted to her husband, as there is compound uncertainty. Did she lose her virginity before or after betrothal? We don't know. And even if she lost her virginity after betrothal, it may have been by means of rape, in which case she is not forbidden to her non-priest husband. So in the face of these two uncertainties, even his claim were not uh, the, the claim of a regular Jew about his wife that he found her not a virgin will not render her prohibited to him. But if he is a priest, it would render her prohibited to him. We skip over to page 10a. It was stated that Rav Nachman said that Shmuel said in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, the sages instituted the marriage contract for Jewish women. What was the amount of money? For a virgin, 200 dinars, and for a widow, 100 dinars. And they deemed the groom credible in that if he says with regard to his virgin bride, I encountered an unobstructed orifice, and she is not a virgin, so then he is deemed credible, causing her to lose her marriage contract. And the Gemara asks, well, if so, and the sages deemed him credible, what did the sages accomplish in their ordinance that the marriage contract of a virgin is 200 dinars if his claim that she is not a virgin is effective? He could always say that and get out of paying. And Rava said the ordinance is effective due to the presumption that a person does not exert himself to prepare a wedding feast and then cause it to be lost. Investing in the wedding preparations clearly indicates that the groom's intention is to marry the bride and rejoice with her. 
If, nevertheless, he claims that she is not a virgin, apparently he is telling the truth. It's not like people would make such a statement, uh, you know, come to court and make such a claim. They wouldn't do that lightly, and they're unlikely to be lying about it. Now, uh, regarding this amount, a virgin has a marriage contract of 200 dinars and non-virgin 100 dinars. So according to Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, who holds that the marriage contract is an obligation by Torah law, the source of 200 dinars for a virgin is clear, as that is the sum of the dowry of a virgin in the Torah. According to the rabbis who hold that it is an obligation by rabbinic law, the reason that the sages instituted 200 dinars is that they concluded that one with that sum, what, which was approximately the basic annual wage. Ah, so... Like the average man, you know, not a rich guy, but an average working man, 200 dinars was one year's worth of wages. And that's enough money that he's not going to be too quick to divorce his wife and owe her that much money. Uh, and so the sages sought to ensure that the divorcee or the widow would not be dependent on the aid of society. If her marriage ended, she would go out with enough money to live for at least a year. The Gemara relates, and now we are still on 10a. A certain man who had never been married came before Rav Nachman and said to him, I encountered an unobstructed orifice when I consummated the marriage. And Rav Nachman said in his regard, Flog him with palm branches. Uh, why? Why did they say, why did Rav Nachman say, This guy who he got married to a virgin bride, and then he comes in and he says, You know what? She's not a virgin. Uh, you know, because there was no obstruction when we, we, we sought to have intercourse. Uh, and we've just been hearing that the whole sort of picking the date of the wedding is so that in case he had to make such a claim, he could come and make it uh, first thing in the morning in court. But when he actually makes such a claim, Rav Nachman says, flog him. Why? Because this man knows what, you know, <laughs> sort of like what to expect when he makes love to a woman. He's supposed to be a virgin too, right? This is the case of young bride and groom uh, who are supposedly having sex for the first time with each other. So if he knows that like the, the way he, she feels is not like a virgin, uh, it's because he's been having sex with prostitutes. And he's a licentious guy and Rob Nachman says, flog him. Uh, as he was never previously married, how was he able to determine whether or not the orifice was unobstructed if he did not gain experience from prostitutes? And the Gemara asks, but isn't Rav Nachman the one who said that he is deemed credible when he claims that he encountered an unobstructed orifice? And the Gemara answers, yes, he is deemed credible, and nevertheless we flog him with palm branches. And Rav Achai answered here, in the case where he is flogged, it is with regard to a bachelor who is not accorded credibility because he lacks experience. But there, in the case where he is accorded credibility, it is with regard to one who has been married. So if he's been married before, okay. Whatever experience he has making love with women, it came because, you know, he was married and he was having sex lawfully. And now maybe his first wife died and he's yet getting married again expecting a virgin bride and finding her not to be a virgin, you know, it, it, it's not proof of his licentiousness that he would have such knowledge, as it were. We skip forward to page 10b, and now Mishnah number 2. Tonight we're going to be covering all of chapter 1, which has 10 Mishnahs in it, and beginning chapter 2. Uh, so Mishnah number two of chapter one, with regard to a virgin, her marriage contract is 200 dinars. And with regard to a widow, her marriage contract is 100 dinars. With regard to a virgin who is a widow, how could a virgin be a widow? So she was married and never consummated. Probably means that she was betrothed, but they never had the full marriage. So with regard to a virgin who is a widow, a divorcee or a chalutza, right, one who performed a chalitza, uh, because she came up for leveret marriage, as we learned in Tractate Yevamos. Uh, regarding, with regard to a virgin who is a widow, or a divorcee, or a chalutza, who achieved that status from a state of betrothal, before marriage and before consummation of the marriage, for all of these, their marriage contract is 200 dinars. And they are subject to a claim concerning their virginity as their presumptive state 
of virginity is intact. If you marry a woman who's never been married, uh, or for other reason we have, you know, she is presumed to be a virgin, and you find her not a virgin, then that's when the groom would make a claim and say, you know, I expected a virgin and didn't get one. Uh, we're not going to do any of the Gemara on Mishnah number two. Go right to Mishnah number three on page 11a. With regard to a female convert or a captive woman or a maid servant who were ransomed with regard to the captive or who converted with regard to the convert or who were freed with regard to the maid servant when they were less than three years and one day old, their marriage contract is 200 dinars as their presumptive status is that of a virgin. Even if they were subject to intercourse when they were younger than three years of age, the hymen remains intact and they are subject to a claim of their, regarding their virginity. But as we see, if they were older than three, uh, but basically what they're saying is if this woman was uh, a, a, a captive, right, or a slave, uh, then it was so common that they were raped by their owners uh, that we don't have an assumption that such a woman would be a virgin when she enters marriage. Again, a lot of these laws sound so harsh and unfeeling, like the, the emotion is, is, is just like we can't really understand it, but that's not what they're discussing, right? What they're discussing is monetary liability in these issues regarding the marriage contract. <clears throat> the ketubah, and whether or not uh, it's the payment of a virgin dowry or a non-virgin dowry. Go to mission number four. Nina, if you're listening, please bring me a glass of water. <laughs> I'm talking very fast and my throat's getting dry. Uh, mission number four. With regard to an adult woman, an adult man who engaged in intercourse with a minor girl who was less than three years old, or a minor boy who was less than nine years old who engaged in intercourse with an adult woman, or a woman who had her hymen ruptured by wood or other foreign object, right? It's not that the only way that a hymen can be ruptured is by having sex. Maybe she just had some kind of an accident, uh, you know, horseback riding, or she fell in a particular way and that, that skin was damaged. It's not that she's not a virgin, it's just that that skin was damaged. Uh, or any other foreign object, so if her hymen was ruptured by wood, or any other foreign object. For all these women, their marriage contract is 200 dinars, as their legal status is that of a virgin. This is the statement of Rabbi Meir. And the rabbis say, thank you so much, honey. Baruch Atah Nanai Lohina Melech Halam Shach, Olin Hibiro. See how closely Nina pays attention? Uh, this is the statement of Rabbi Meir. And the rabbis say the marriage contract of a woman whose hymen was ruptured by wood is 100 dinars. As physically, since her hymen is not intact, she is no longer a virgin. And so there you see something quite interesting that they're not making some kind of a moral judgment in this situation. They're not examining the law of licentiousness and whether a virgin has committed a sin or not. These are, they're just not, that's not the question that is being debated. It's a question, they debate it elsewhere. Here, they're debating what are the financial consequences of marrying a virgin or a non-virgin. And so they're saying if the hymen is ruptured, uh, in terms of this financial liability, she's considered not a virgin. Now, with regard to a virgin who is either a widow, a divorcee, or a chalutza, and who achieved that status from a state of marriage, as opposed to betrothal, for all these women, their marriage contract is 100 dinars. In other words, if a woman was married and she says, but we never had sex, I'm still a virgin, uh, it might be true, but her presumptive state is that if she was married you know, and, and shared a bed with her husband, even though maybe they never had sex, she's considered a non-virgin. And so her marriage contract is 100 dinars, not 200 dinars. And they are not subject to a claim concerning their virginity. The husband has nothing to say whether they're a virgin or not because they're presumed to be not virgins. And similarly, with regard to a female convert or a captive woman or a maidservant who were ransomed with regard to the captive or who converted with regard to the convert or who were freed with regard to the maidservant, when they were more than three years and one day old, their marriage contract is 100 dinars and they are not subject to a claim concerning their virginity. 
Skip a little bit down about the Gemara of this mission number four. Rava said that this is what the mission is saying. An adult man who engaged in intercourse with a minor girl. Now, I'm going to read a passage that is very often cited uh, by, hate, by people who hate Jews, right? by the enemies of the Jews. They cite this passage, they pull it out of context, and they say, oh, Anybody who reads the Talmud, anyone who holds by the Talmud, anyone who's a Jew, is some kind of a, a, a child uh, molesting rapist. And that, and that Jewish law uh, allows men to rape young girls. That, that nothing could be further than the truth. It is an absolute lie. And while we're skipping around, I could have easily skipped this passage. But I want to share with you so that you understand how these, you know, Talmud accusations uh, kind of foment this lie, right? So the passage goes like this. Rav has said that this is what the mission is saying. An adult man who engaged in intercourse with a minor girl less than three years old has done nothing as intercourse with a girl less than three years old is tantamount to poking a finger into the eye. Now, if you stop reading there, it's saying, yeah, well, okay, if he rapes a young girl, it's like he's done nothing at all. He's not going to be punished. No, that's not what it means that he has done nothing. It means that he has not removed from her her virgin status. She's still treated like a virgin when she gets married and she gets that dowry of two, or she gets that marriage contract worth 200 dinars. Elsewhere in the Talmud, we say what happens when a man rapes a child and the answer is the death penalty, right? So you could pull this out of context and it's just a lie, right? It, taking things out of context is a very effective and evil and pernicious way of lying. So when people see, if you ever hear that Talmudic accusation, it is a lie. Okay, we move forward to Mishnah number five on page 12a. A man who eats at the house of his father-in-law in Judea after betrothal and without witnesses to attest to the fact that he was not alone with his betrothed is unable to make a claim concerning virginity after marriage because, in accordance with the custom of Judea, the assumption is that he secluded himself with her. And the concern is that he, it was he who engaged in intercourse with her. And so here, this, and that's all of mission number five, but what they're talking about is that there were different regions within the land of Israel at different times in history where there were different regional traditions. And whereas in one region, <clears throat> when a couple was betrothed, they would never really see each other until they finally came together for the wedding itself. And after that, they would begin living together as man and wife. But in one of those regions, a part of Judea, uh, it was customary for the husband, the, you know, for the betrothed man and woman to spend some time together in, uh, in, the, in the girl's father's house uh, to get to know each other prior to their wedding for various reasons. And because they spent some time together, uh, if this guy says, you know, and then when I finally married her, I found that she wasn't a virgin, we don't believe him because we say, well, you know what, maybe you're the one who slept with her. It's possible. And this is actually a kind of doubt that goes in the favor of the girls of Judea. And why do they do that? The reason for this custom in Judea is cited by several commentaries in the Jerusalem Talmud. And it was related to the Roman decree that virgin brides submit to intercourse with the prefect first. To ensure that the woman would not submit to the prefect willingly, they sought in Judea to bolster the relationship between the bride and groom by cultivating a more intimate relationship between them. And not only that, it's almost like they would prefer that this bride and groom, once they're betrothed, if they sleep together, they've actually moved forward to the state of being married. They haven't really done, it's licentious, they're not supposed to do it, they're not supposed to sleep together before they have their actual wedding under the wedding canopy. But since they're already betrothed, if they then sleep together, they simply now have married each other. And in Judea, where there was so much danger of this uh, prima nocta tradition where the Roman would come and rape the girl on the night of her wedding, 
Well, at least she gave a virginity to her own husband. And then later, you know, if they go under the wedding canopy and the Roman general is going to steal her from that, uh, you know, she's being raped by this man. Horrible. But at least that wasn't the first time she made love in her life. That would have happened with her husband. That's not really the practice the sages were promoting. What they were really saying is at least let them get to know each other. But if that resulted, it wouldn't be so bad in times of danger. Mishnah number six. For both a widow who is an Israelite woman and a widow who is the daughter of priests, her marriage contract is 100 dinars. A court of priests would collect a marriage contract of 400 dinars for a virgin daughter of a priest, twice the sum of the standard marriage contract for a virgin, and the sages did not reprimand them. And from that, they established that, you know, these amounts, 200 for a virgin girl and 100 for a non-virgin, those are minimums. But if a family was well-to-do and wanted to say, oh, listen, you want to marry my daughter? You have to come up with a ketubah or a kasuba of a thousand dinars or two thousand dinars uh, before we're going to permit her to marry you in case you leave her high and dry. They were permitted to raise the amount. They just couldn't lower the amount. Skipping forward, Mishnah number seven on page 12b. The, there is the case of one who marries a woman and did not find her hymen intact. And she says, after you betrothed me, I was raped. And his, i.e. her husband's, field was inundated. Meaning that it is his misfortune that she is not a virgin as she was raped after betrothal, right? After they were betrothed, okay, you know, they, they were already attached to each other. If she was raped during that period, it's kind of a misfortune that he suffers in the sense that, uh, you know, it wasn't her fault, it wasn't his fault, but it happened while she was already kind of under his auspices since they were already betrothed. So he can't say, well, she's not a virgin and I'm going to divorce her. It, it, it's his bad luck that it happened after they were betrothed. If the rape happened before they were betrothed, then he could say, well, I was told that I was betrothing a virgin girl and it was not true. She'd been raped and you didn't tell me. But if it happened after the betrothal, it's just his bad luck. Obviously much more her bad luck. But again, we're talking about financial consequences. And he says, no, rather you were raped before I betrothed you and my transaction was a mistaken transaction. So Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Eliezer says she is deemed credible when she says I was raped after the betrothal. Rabbi Yehoshua says it is not based on the statement emerging from her mouth that we conduct our lives. Rather, this woman assumes the presumptive status of one who engaged in intercourse when she was not yet betrothed and she misled him until she brings proof supporting her statement. That's what Rabbi Yehoshua says, but the law is according to Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Eliezer. She is deemed credible. She is believed. Mishnah number eight on page 13a. See how we're flying through chapter one? There's 10 Mishnahs in chapter one. Now we're on Mishnah number eight. In a case where she says, I am one whose hymen was ruptured by wood, right? It has nothing to do with rape. It's just that there was some kind of an accident uh, and that's what led to her hymen being ruptured. Uh, so she admits that her hymen is not intact, but she claims that it was not ruptured through intercourse or rape or anything like that. And the groom says, no, rather you are one who was trampled by a man and your hymen was ruptured through intercourse, either willingly by you or through rape. But at any rate, it was done by a man. Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Eliezer say she is deemed credible. Rabbi Yehoshua says she needs to prove her claim. And we follow Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Eliezer who say she is deemed credible. In the Gemara, uh, uh, so these two, la these two missions that we just read were very similar to each other. In one, she claims she was raped after she was betrothed. In the other, she says my hymen uh, was... Uh, ruptured, you know, in an accident, not through any kind of intercourse. And in both cases, we believe her. So why do we need both Mishnahs? Isn't the point that whatever she says, we believe. And so the Gemara answers these two similar, these disputes, though very similar, were both necessary to be recorded as Mishnahs. Why? One is to convey to you the far-reaching nature of Rabban Gamliel, who believes her in both cases, 
and also the far-reaching nature of Rabbi Yehoshua, who disbelieves her in both cases. And you could make distinctions about why we should believe in one case and not the other. But Rabbi Gamliel believes her in both cases. Rabbi Yehoshua doesn't believe her in both cases. Mishnah number nine. If people saw a woman speaking to one man, but they did not recognize him, and they said to her, what is the nature of this man? And she said to them, well, he is a man called so-and-so, and he is a priest. So Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Eliezer say she is deemed credible. And Rabbi Yehoshua says it is not based on her statement that we conduct our lives. She has to bring evidence of what it is that she is claiming. And when they say she was speaking to a man, what do they actually mean? It means that she was secluded with this man or possibly even that she had intercourse with the man. Well, if so, who was that man? Was he a Jew? If he was a Jew, was he a Jew of... Uh, unflawed lineage, meaning he's, was he not a momser, right? Because if she had sex with this man and he's a momser and she gets pregnant, then her child is a momser. Similarly, if a single woman was pregnant and people said to her, she's single, she's not married and now she's pregnant. So people say to her, well, what is the nature of this fetus? And she says to them, it is from a man called so-and-so and he is a priest. So Rabbi Gamli and Rabbi Eliezer said, she's deemed credible. And Rabbi Yehoshua says, she needs to bring proof. The Gemara. The Gemara asks, what is the meaning of speaking mentioned in the Mishnah? And Zairi said it means that she secluded herself with a man and is unknown whether or not she engaged in intercourse. Rav Asi said it means that she engaged in intercourse and we know it. Now granted, according to Zairi, that is why the Mishnah teaches the case employing the term speaking as it is certain only that they were in seclusion, that they had opportunity to commit intercourse, but we don't know whether they did or not. However, according to Rav Asi, what is the reason that the Mishnah employed the term speaking if he's certain that it means she had intercourse? And the Gemara answers, the Mishnah em- em- employed a euphemism as it is written with regard to licentious women. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness, Proverbs 30, 20. And the verse euphemistically ascribes the act of intercourse to the mouth instead of the appropriate body part, as it were. And we see that often that the Talmud and even the Torah speaks in euphemisms. You know, he knew her uh, when it means that they had sex together uh, or in this case that they spoke. But what it really means is that they had the opportunity to have intercourse and then if she becomes pregnant, you know, we want to know what is the nature of that fetus or when she becomes pregnant, we know she had sex with someone. Uh, it's not just a possibility that she had sex with someone. Uh, then what are the financial consequences of that going to be? We skip forward a few pages. Uh, And now we are on page 14b. Rabbi Yochanan said, the case of one uh, who, when called a momzer, now that we're speaking about momzers, right? A momzer is a a person who was born of of an illicit union, meaning a married woman, a Jewish woman married to a Jewish man. <clears throat> meaning a legal wedding, a legal marriage, and she gets pregnant by a Jewish man who is not her husband. The child of that illicit adulterous union is a momzer. And the momzer is prohibited to marry any Jew uh, who is not himself or herself a momzer. A momzer can only marry another momzer. There's a few other exceptions to that, but the main point is that a regular Jew and certainly a priest cannot marry a momzer. Uh, So Rabbi Yochanan said the case of one who when called a momzer screams and protests that he is being slandered. And when called a halal is silent. A halal is if a priest married a divorced woman. He's prohibited from doing that. But if he did it anyway, so then, and he has a son, so that son is a priest, but he is a disqualified priest. Because his father married a woman who was prohibited to him, a priest cannot marry a divorcee. If he did so anyway, the child is a priest, but he's disqualified from serving in the holy temple. So one who uh, who screams and protests when he's called a momzer and saying, I've been slandered, but when he's called a halal is silent, he is the subject of a dispute between the Tanaim and the Barisa. The first Tana holds anyone who, when others call him unfit and he is silent, we assume he's unfit as his silence confirms the allegation. 
And this is what the first Tana is saying. Who is the widow whose late husband was a member of a priestly family of questionable lineage who is fit to marry a priest? It is one who married into any family that has neither unfitness due to silence in response to allegations of moms or status, nor silence in response to allegations of Gibeonite status, which are prohibited for a Jew to marry, nor silence in response to allegations that they were the slaves of kings, nor silence in response to allegations of halal status, right? We're supposed to be meek and not, you know, uh, get all angry when people call us names. But if the name they call us uh, is something that would render us unfit to marry into any portion of the Jewish people, no, there you're not meek. There you protest that a lie has been told about you, if in fact it's a lie. Uh, if you're silent, it's because it's true. People are going to assume that it's true. So if it's a lie, speak up. Mishnah number 10 at the bottom of 14b. Rabbi Yose said there was an incident involving a young girl who descended to fill her jug with water from the spring. And she was raped. And the identity of the rapist was unknown. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri said, if the majority of the people of the city marry their daughters to members of the priesthood, this young girl may be married to a member of the priesthood. Right? We don't know who raped her. Now she's going to have a child. What they're basically going to analyze here is, <clears throat> can we assume uh, that the father was a Jew? Can we assume that the father was a priest? Can we assume that the father was a disqualified priest? And basically they're going to say, well, what's the majority of the men, you know, who the, the, who the, pot, who the rapist could possibly be a, a part of, right? Of, of what subpopulation of men was the rapist likely to be a part so that we could make some assumptions uh, about the lineage of that baby born from a rape. Uh, okay, we skip forward. Uh, are we doing on time? Okay, we're going to skip that. And that is all we're going to do for chapter one. We conclude chapter one. Uh, and we move forward to chapter 2. We're on page 15b. Mishnah number 1 of chapter 2. Now we're getting much more into testimony. Really the laws of testimony. With regard to a woman who was widowed or divorced and is now claiming payment of her marriage contract that is not before the court. The marriage contract itself is not before the court. And she says, you married me as a virgin. Uh, and therefore I'm entitled to 200 dinars. And he says, no, rather I married you as a widow. So you are only entitled to 100 dinars now that we're getting divorced. Then if there are witnesses that she went out of her father's house to her wedding with a hinuma or with her hair uncovered, meaning in a manner typical of virgins, so then payment of her marriage contract is 200 dinars. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Baroka says, even testimony that there was distribution of roasted grain, which was customary at the weddings of virgins, constitutes proof that she is a virgin. Right? So they had a ketubah, because all marriages have to have a ketubah, but the ketubah was lost. Now they're getting divorced. And she says, well, when we got married, I was a virgin. So give me my 200 dinars. And he says, when we got married, you know, 20, 30 years ago, whenever it was, you were not a virgin. I'm only going to pay you 100 dinars. So they can, she can bring witnesses to show that, well, the kind of wedding we had is the kind of wedding people have when they marry a virgin. Uh, and that is the proof. And give me the 200 dinars. And that's how it works. Several disputes between Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi Yehoshua were cited previously with regard to the credibility according, accorded to the respective claims of parties to a dispute. Based on one of those disputes, now the ton of this mission of the first mission, chapter 2, adds, and Rabbi Yehoshua concedes in a case where one says to another, this field, which is currently in my possession, belonged to your father, and I purchased from him. I purchased it from him. This man is deemed credible. <clears throat> now we move completely away from the laws of marriage contract, but since we're talking about testimony that is deemed credible, we're going to look at this purchase and sale of land and other objects where we don't have the contract before us. Uh, what testimony about the nature of the contract will we believe? Here where he says, uh, well, this field, it once belonged to your father, and I purchased it from him. This He is deemed credible. Why? His entire claim is accepted. The court accepts not only his admission that it once belonged to the other side's father, but also his statement that he 
purchased it. Why? 16a. This is so because, and here's a common phrase in Talmudic legal analysis, the mouth that prohibited is the mouth that permitted. In other words, this man claimed that the field once belonged to the other guy's father. If he, what he could have said is, this field's always been mine. Who do, who do you to come here and say you want to take my field? This field's always been mine. You don't have any paperwork to show otherwise, this field is mine. But instead, the guy says, no, this field did once belong to your father. It wasn't always mine, but I bought it from your father, and that's why it's mine now. So, by saying this field was once your family's, he's admitting something that is sort of against his own interest. So, by showing that he's willing to tell the truth, by giving information that is somewhat hurtful to his own claim that the field is his now, we believe his entire testimony that the field was once not his and now it is his because he gave information, whoops, he gave information uh, that is considered pre prejudicial to his own case. And that's called the mouth that prohibited is the mouth that permitted. I uh, claim that he purchased the field. Even if he had not admitted that it belonged to the other's father, the field would have remained in his possession. Right? When you come to say you have something in your possession that actually belongs to me and you go to court, so you're going to have, you're the one who has to bring proof because whoever has possession, you know, that old phrase, possession is nine tenths of the law. That's actually true in the sense that if you want to dislodge ownership from someone who has it, you have to bring the evidence. Since he already has the field, he didn't need to say anything like, well, once the field didn't belong to me. Since he offers that information freely, it bolsters his claim that he later purchased it. However, if there are witnesses that the field belonged to his father, and the one who has the field in his possession says, I purchased it from him, he is not deemed credible, and his claim is rejected. Now, he might have the field now, but witnesses come and say, well, this field that you say is yours, it actually belonged to that guy's father. Now, this guy's saying, yeah, but I bought it from his father. Yeah, but you don't have the purchase agreement, right? He doesn't have the paperwork. That's why we're having this conversation. So now, the presumptive status of that field is according to the testimony of two witnesses who say, no, that field belonged to that family. This guy who says it's his because he purchased it, why should we believe him? And now, we don't have the mouth that prohibited is the mouth that permitted Gemara. The Gemara infers the reason that the bride's claim is accepted is specifically due to the fact that there are witnesses that she went out of her father's house to the wedding in a hinuma, which is customary of virgin brides. However, if there are no witnesses, so the husband is deemed credible. She's the one who's seeking to get his payment of a 200 dinar virgin dowry payment, virgin marriage contract payment, she, he has the money now, she's trying to get it. So she's the one who has to bring proof. If she had the witnesses that show, you know, it was, she, she was a virgin when they got married, okay, then she brought the proof. But if she doesn't have witnesses like that, then uh, he is deemed credible because the presumptive status of that money is with him and she didn't bring evidence to dislodge it. And the Gemara answers, uh, uh, yeah, now the Gemara answers. So, so let us say that the unattributed ruling that we learned in the Mishnah is not in accordance with the opinion of Rabban Gamliel. As if the ruling was in accordance with Rabban Gamliel, didn't he say that the bride is always deemed credible? And the Gemara answers, even if you will say that the ruling is in the Mishnah is in accordance with the opinion of Rabban Gamliel, Rabban Gamliel stated his opinion only there in a case where the claim of the bride is certain and the claim of the groom is uncertain, as the groom does not know what actually happened. However, here in a case where the claim of the bride is certain, I was a virgin, and the claim of the groom is also certain, you are not a virgin, uh, as he is certain that he married her as a widow, then Rabban Gamliel did not say that her claim is deemed uh, credible in such a case uh, where it's certainty versus certainty, only where there's certainty versus uncertainty did we have room uh, for that principle. We skip forward to page 17a, and here's a very, very famous principle. It comes up here in the law of marriages, but gets, this gets quoted uh, very often uh, in Talmudic lore and classes. We're running a little bit long, but we're going to you know, finish uh, so that we're caught up after today. Well, it, it, don't worry, we only have a few more minutes. 
Uh, here's a very famous teaching on page 17a. One recites praise of the bride as she is. Uh, let's start, let me start here. The sage is taught. How does one dance before the bride, i.e., what does one recite while dancing at her wedding? And Bey Shammai, the followers of Shammai, say, one recites praise of the bride as she is, emphasizing her good qualities. Meaning, if she's very physically unattractive, but she's very kind, what do you tell the new groom? Oh, your wife is so kind. She is a wonderful, wonderful person. Her kindness is famous through the land. And Base Hillel say, one recites a fair and attractive bride. Base Hillel said, even if she's physically very unattractive, you tell her groom, her new husband, what a beautiful bride you married. In other words, you lie. You tell a little white lie. Uh, to enhance the joy of the wedding. It is always appropriate to tell the groom that his bride is beautiful. And the law follows Base Hillel. Beis Shammai said to Base Hillel, and in a case where the bride was lame or blind, does one pray, say with regard to her that she is a fair and attractive bride? But the Torah states, keep you from a false matter. And Beis Hillel said to Beis Shammai, well, according to your statement with regard to one who acquired an inferior acquisition from the market, should another praise it and enhance its value in his eyes or condemn it and diminish its value in his eyes? Well, you must say that he should praise it and enhance its value in his eyes and refrain from causing him anguish. And from here, the, the sages said, a person's disposition should always be empathetic with mankind and treat everyone courteously. In this case too, once the groom has married his bride, one praises her as being fair and attractive. If your buddy comes to you and says, what do you think, should I marry so-and-so or not? Okay, then you might tell him the truth, what you think. But once they're married, the only comment you can make to a groom at a wedding is, wow, you married the most beautiful woman in the world. Unless you yourself are married and you might say, you, wow, you married the second most beautiful woman in the world. With regard to the mitzvah of bringing joy to the bride and groom, the Gemara relates, the sages said about Rabbi Yehuda bar Eli that he would take a myrtle branch and dance before the bride and say, a fair and attractive bride. And Rav Shmuel bar Rav Yitzhak would base his dance on three myrtle branches that he would juggle. So this was a great Torah sage, revered Torah scholar. And at the wedding, he would become like silly and be a juggler, right? He would sort of put aside his dignity in order to entertain the bride and groom and make them laugh and have a memorable good time at their wedding. And he was accused of demeaning the honor of Torah scholars by acting in a manner unbecoming of a Torah scholar, even though he was celebrating a wedding. And what did they say? No, he did the right thing and he was honored all his life and at his death, heaven proclaimed that an incredible man had passed from this world. Uh, and what is the merit that he had that allowed that? Not only his learning, but the fact that he rejoiced with gusto at weddings in order to entertain the bride and groom and didn't stand on his own dignity. Mishnah number two here in chapter two on page 18b with regard to the witnesses who said in their testimony to ratify their signatures in a document, we signed the document and this is our handwriting. However, we were compelled to sign or we were minors when we signed or we were disqualified witnesses. For example, we were relatives of one of the parties. They are deemed credible, right? So they signed the marriage contract as the witnesses. You have to have witnesses sign a marriage contract. And so later they came and said, yes, that's our signature, but... We shouldn't have signed. We were minors. We weren't allowed to sign it. Or we were coerced to sign it. Or we were disqualified because we were actually relatives of the people involved and we shouldn't have been the ones signing it. Uh, so th when they say that, yes, I signed it, but the wedding contract is no good because you know I was a disqualified witness, uh, they are deemed credible. Since the document is ratified on the basis of their testimony, it is likewise invalidated on the basis of their testimony. However, if there are other witnesses who testify that it is their handwriting, or if their handwriting emerges on a document from another place, enabling confirmation of their signatures by comparing the two documents, then the witnesses who signed the document are not deemed credible. 
right? If we need them to come in and say, yes, that's my signature, then they can also, they're also believed to say, but I shouldn't have signed it. But if we can establish <coughs> that that's their signature without having them come in and testify, then the wedding document, you know, is a proper document. And the fact that they come in later and say, yeah, but I shouldn't have signed it, that testimony is set aside. And it's considered a valid document. And that's where we're going to finish tonight. Uh, we have reached uh, the, you know, uh, well into, uh, oh no, wait, there's one more thing I'm going to read on page 20A. Today's duff is page 20. I'm just going to read two short things, then go to co questions and comments, and then we'll pick it up tomorrow with mission number three of chapter two, which sits at, toward the end of page 20B. But the last point we'll cover tonight from the Gemara on mission number two of chapter two, the sage is taught a person may write his testimony in a document and testify on its basis even after several years have passed, right? If you had notes and then later you're called to testify in a case about something that happened years ago, you can refresh your recollection from those notes. You might think, well, wait a minute, why can you use this written document to refresh your recollection? That document is not itself admissible in court. What we want is your testimony of what you saw. That's how matters are established in court. Rav Huna said, and that is the law only if he remembers the testimony on his own and he uses the document merely to refresh his memory with regard to certain details. But if he can't remember what happened, all his only memory is that he wrote it down and now he's going to read what he wrote at that time, then we're relying on an unwitnessed document and that we cannot do. That testimony will not be permitted. It's only if he can testify where, okay, his memory's jostled a little bit by looking at his notes from back then, but we're not relying on the notes for him to produce his testimony. Rabbi Yochanan said, one may rely on that written testimony even if he does not remember the testimony by himself at all. If he says, those are my notes, and now I'm going to read them to you, we can rely on that, for, according to Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi said, conclude from this statement of Rabbi Yochanan, with regard to these two witnesses who know testimony in a certain case, and one of them forgot the testimony, uh, one witness may remind his fellow witness of the testimony, as according to Rabbi Yochanan, even if the witness remembers the testimony only by means of an external stimulus, the testimony is valid. And a dilemma was raised before the sages. If the litigant himself reminds the witness of the testimony, what is the ruling? And Rav Chaviva said, even if the litigant himself reminds the witness, he may testify. And Mar, the son of Rav Ashi, said, if the litigant himself reminds the witness, the witness may not testify. And the Gemara concludes that the law is that if the litigant himself reminds the witness of the testimony, the witness may not testify due to the concern that the litigant influenced the nature of his testimony. But... The Gemara will go on and say, but if the litigant himself is a Torah scholar, then we're not concerned that he would, uh, you know, in a false manner, influence the witness to jostle his memory. He would only encourage him to tell the truth and just remind him, but didn't you see something? Wasn't it sort of like, and did the guy like, oh yeah, that is what happened. Now I remember it. That's going to be permitted. You know, obviously we're not getting into uh, the, the real nuance and depth and detail of these evidentiary laws. And we're going to encounter them again uh, in various places in our journey through the Talmud. But you see how we started in the law of, uh, of, of marriage contract and what financial consequences accrue, uh, whether she enters as a virgin or not a virgin, what caused her non-virginity, if it's an actual non-virginity or if just a rupturing of the hymen, etc. And then who can testify about that? And then we just leave the laws of marriage and marital contracts altogether just to talk about testimony that is admissible uh, and, 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 and when such testimony is going to be admissible in order to establish written agreements or notes or other kinds of documents. Okay, we made it through. We're caught up. We're on page 20. Uh, I'll just quickly check to see if there are any questions. I know we've been running very long. Uh, so I'll just take, you know, a couple of questions. I'm in the wrong document. If I can 
find this document quickly. <laughs> I'll see if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, Sharon. My dad said in Poland they felt it was beneficial to marry on Tuesday because the Torah says it was good twice. Exactly. We, we have, I think we covered that a little bit somewhere in these pages that we just didn't have time for, and I'm sure it's going to come up again. Uh, but yeah, in the six days of creation, uh, on the third day, in the Bible it says it was good twice, and that's why a lot of weddings will happen on a Tuesday, even today. Yosef, relatively speaking, uh, how much would 200 dinars be? Uh, and, and Sharon said, and you did not marry on Monday because that's the only day of creation where they didn't say, and God saw that it was good. It's not said at all about Monday, but Tuesdays, God says it twice. So that's an auspicious day to get married. Yosef, relatively speaking, how much would 200 dinars be uh, in our world where there's one year salary for an average working man, right? So that, that's the amount. Sharon, at what point did the prayer switch from the husband, uh, for, did the payer switch from the husband paying money for the bride to the father of the bride have to come up with a dowry to marry off his daughter, right? And they were looking at this idea that uh, the reason they established 200 dinars as the marriage, se- the marriage contract payment is related to the idea that a dowry paid by the father of the bride to the groom was also 200 dinars. But that was according to one opinion. The other opinion is not. So the concept of dowry uh, existed you know, before there was marriage contract. The marriage contract was instituted to protect the woman from a casual divorce from the husband. The concept of dowry uh, was to attract a, a groom to your daughter. So they're sort of they seem to be related concepts, but they're not really. And one is about the beginning of marriage and the other is about the end of marriage, uh, although it's established at the beginning of marriage. Uh, And finally, Yonatan, how about simply saying, you make a beautiful couple? Sure, why not? Certainly what you want to do at a wedding is help the bride and groom rejoice. And if you're not a juggler, okay, you don't have to go juggling, but you certainly want to say something sweet and help them sing and dance and make merry, right? You just want to add to the joy. All right, my friends, this was a long journey uh, for an AT Daily. We're running an hour and 20 minutes, but we covered 18 pages. So we did a lot. Now we're caught up. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't be teaching while I was coaching at the Maccabea Games, but I'm back now. God's help. We'll move forward tomorrow. Just one page uh, when we gather again at 6 p.m. the regular time to do page 21 here in Tractate Kisubos. Have a great night.